Well, as I mentioned earlier, we have been reading through the story together. And again, it's, a, it's a, an abridged version of the Bible, and it's in chronological order. It's not the Bible in total, but it has large portions. And today we are in the 28th chapter. We've This week, as a congregation, we've read through, and we just read chapter 28. And as a practice on Sunday, we now read from God's Word, and we'll discuss one portion of what we went through in chapter 28. So this morning we're going to read from Acts chapter 12. Why don't we pray that God would open His Word to us. Almighty and ungracious Lord, we are here to honor and glorify Your holy name. We pray that in this time, that Your Spirit would move among us lifting up your word that we might hear it, to take it in, to find our lives changed and challenged to live for you. Help us, O oh Lord, as we listen. Help us to hear what you have to say to us and help us to respond. We pray this, Jesus, through your precious name. Amen. We're reading from the Acts of the Apostles, the 12th chapter, beginning at the first verse and reading all the way through to the 19th verse. About that time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews... He proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel, that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod, from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers of what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, 
He examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're coming up on another holiday, uh, 4th of July, another time likely to spend time together with family. And when we get together like that with family, we often pull out the photo albums, don't we? You know, and start flipping past to the other years. And there's always that time where you, you look at a photo, and it's familiar. You know, the, you remember being there or, or you're asking about an event where you recognize all the participants, but you can't quite place it. When was that? Was that before or after? And you see that, that those mental gymnastics trying to remember what happened in what order. And just when you think you have it right, someone else says, no, 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 that was after such and such. Because remember we did this or so-and-so got married then and, and everybody resets the calendar and realizes, oh yeah, that's right. This morning, we are opening the photo album of the church. Putting up the photo album of the church, and we're flipping through, and we've come across this moment, this tremendous, awful, amazing moment. I want you to remember what has happened here. I want you to remember the context in which we view this picture. You see, the church. Jesus ascended into heaven was started with the Spirit moving among the disciples, now apostles. And they began to preach boldly the Word of God. They began to share the good news of what God had done through His Son, Jesus Christ. And they received punishment for what they were doing, but they kept on. And such that it, it became clear that the Jew, Jewish religious leadership had to shut it down. And so they began to persecute those who were following. And they began to really clamp down on those who believed in Christ. Such that in one occasion, they actually stoned one of the followers. His name was Stephen. And following in that stoning of Stephen, that killing of Stephen, the church begins to spread out, to disperse to go to other cities, other lands. Persecution is on. And Saul is the agent of that persecution, and he pursues them to every corner. He's knocking on houses. It's a roller coaster ride, really, for the early church. There's moments of deep despair, and there's moments of excitement as well. There's this moment when they realize that Saul, the very one who's persecuting the church, actually comes to believe that Christ is Lord as well. His name changes to Paul. And it's such a dramatic change that many in the church, the church of Jesus Christ, can't believe that he's really following Christ. They think it's a trick. And there's this other event that's a highlight. Peter is sent by the Spirit to speak to a Roman centurion a Roman commander of a hundred soldiers. And this commander has come to believe that Jesus is Lord. And his whole house, household is baptized. Peter goes back to share the good news. But we come across this picture on yet another downturn, another time of despair. You see, no longer is just the Jewish religious leadership pursuing to persecute the church. But now, Herod, the ruler of the area, Herod, the grandson of Herod the Great, Herod the Great, the one who wanted Jesus killed in the first place, Herod, the grandson, the one who, when he was growing up, he grew up in Rome, and his playmates were actually the future emperors of Rome. This Herod had power. And this Herod decides to join the fight against the followers of the way, against Christians. He violently lays hands on many of them. And one of them, James, the brother, actually slays with the sword. 
And when he sees that the Jews actually rejoice in what he's doing, he decides to lay hands on Peter as well, another one of these leaders of the way. That's the picture. That's the background we see. That's why this picture starts to come into focus and we realize it's not only a photo album of the church, it's a picture of prayer. Prayer. You know, during Lent, we focused on prayer. We had a Lenten series on prayer where many of us gathered in the evening to talk about prayer. How do we pray? And we followed one of those basic, uh, oh, the word suddenly, I just flew out of my mind. Can you imagine? I lost it. An acronym. ACTS, A-C-T-S. Different forms of prayer. ACTS, A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Big church words. Adoration, realizing that some of prayer is just simply adoring God for who He is. Praising His holy name. That prayer, our prayers certainly have to have a component of adoration. That prayer also involves confession, realizing that when we're in the presence of the Holy One, the One who is perfect in every way, how much we don't match up and how much we need to confess we fall short. That prayers of confession are necessary. Indeed, every time we worship, we come together and we confess who we are when we come into the presence of God as God's people. And then thanksgiving. Oh, that's the time to thank God for what God's done in our lives. To appreciate how God has already been holding us and bringing us along. And then that S, that big word, supplication. In other words, ask. Those prayers, we say, God, please help. Would you do this? You know, it's the prayer that every student has when they sit down and that surprise quiz is laid on their desk. It's that prayer that every soldier has in a foxhole. It's that, please save me, help me, supplication. It's a great acronym. It doesn't cover all of prayer. And part of the reason we met during Lent was not only just to go through the formula of prayer, rather to say that prayer is about drawing nearer God. If we just treat prayer as a formula, we miss what it's all about. It's about drawing us closer to God, our getting closer to who God is and our discovering who God wants us to be, drawing nearer which works well into this last piece of prayer that we haven't yet talked about. Intercessory prayer. It's supplication, but not for ourselves, for someone else. We're interceding for someone else. And this morning, as we look at this photo of prayer of the church, we see the church gathered together and earnestly praying. That's the word, earnestly praying for Peter, earnestly praying, earnest. You know, one of, the, one of the theologians in the commentaries I was working through put it this way. It's earnest as intensity without negligence or failure. Earnest is intensity without ne neglig negligence or failure. Intensity. Earnestly praying. That's what the church was doing. They were praying for Peter. Now why? Because the trajectory of where things were going was so strong, that up and down ride that they'd been on, now was at such a low point, see where it was going, they were earnestly praying for Peter. You know, we believe rather strongly that the gospel writer of Luke also wrote the book of Acts. 
that Luke is volume one and the Acts of the Apostles is volume two. There are many reasons we believe this. I could go into them, but I have to tell you, they're pretty strong reasons. And Luke, the gospel writer, only uses this word earnest twice. Here, where we're reading it. And the first time he uses it, when Jesus is in the garden, praying to his father just before he's about to be arrested, praying that this cup would pass from him. Matter of fact, it's in that passage, Luke is the only one who writes about him sweating to the point of blood. That's the picture of earnest that we are to see. That intensity. You know, this is a picture of the church. The church of Jesus Christ praying. It's just like the photo album we have here at Second Reform. Where we remember gathering around Sherry DeHaan. Getting out of our seats and laying hands on her and praying for her. That the cancer would be abated. That it would be held back. And how much longer did we have her? Praise be to God. It's a picture of this church just, just a few weeks back. Praying for the, the uh, nieces of Sharon and Ray. Praying for them as they were lost somewhere in upstate Michigan. And they were found. Eating Girl Scout cookies. That's the picture. It's an earnest entity. It's what grabs our heart, draws us closer to God and says, God, please. Please. I know I pray to you about a lot of things, but this one, please. Now, two times we have the picture. In Jesus' case, the cup is not taken from him. In this case, God does answer. That's because there's three things going on in this prayer. One, God has the power to change the course of power. God has the ability to answer prayer, is the second part. And the third part is to remember that prayer is always about God being glorified. Did you hear that? God being glorified. So changing the trajectory of power and authority. They are praying earnestly because they know where this is going. They know what happened to James. And there's nothing better for Herod to do than to do the same to Peter. How is it possible to be praying so fervently, so strongly, so our heart and everything is invested so deeply and still not believe it to happen. But that's where they are. Did you catch the number of times in which this small story, we hear people so certain of the direction this is going that they can't even believe that the change of trajectory is happening? It begins with Peter. Peter is there. The, there's four sets of four guards. He's dealing with one of those four sets, One's chained to one hand, one's chained to the other hand, and there's two more outside his prison door. He's woken up by the angel. The chains fall off his hands. He's told to dress. And he walks past the other two guards. And when he gets to that final gate that exits the whole prison system, it just opens. In all of this, Peter is not thinking about, oh, God is finally freeing me. Peter is thinking that he's having a vision. Why? Because these things don't happen. The trajectory is set. The power is set. We know where it's going. It has the full backing of Rome. Even when he gets outside and he's walking with the angel and the angel suddenly disappears, he suddenly realizes what's happened. 
But that's not the only place. He goes to tell the others. He gets to the gate. The gate of the very house in which they're gathered and praying earnestly for him. The servant girl answers. Why? Because they're praying. She recognizes his voice, is so blown away by the reality it's him, she doesn't even open it. Ironically, she's the one person who believes. The servant. She goes back and reports it, and what do they say? What's their first response? You're mad. You're out of your mind. Think about that. Their trajectory of their prayer is for him to be freed. But they know the trajectory of where it's going. This is a picture of the church. Do you see this? This is who we are. We are being called to pray and pray earnestly, to draw closer to the very feet of God, and yet while we do it, we often are in another mind of believing it won't be. When we're feeling guilty and sad, we don't have it quite right, or maybe I didn't have enough faith, we are no different than the early church. And yet, we are to have faith. As one good preacher once put it, if you're going to pray for rain on a sunny day, you best carry an umbrella. That's our struggle. We are both in the world and not of this world at the same time. We know the trajectory of the world, and yet we're being called to live a different reality. They, even in their earnest prayer, as they were begging and pleading, God for Peter, they also were in the back of their mind trying to fight out that they knew where this was going to go, such that when the servant girl comes back and says, he's at the gate, they're like, you're mad. And then as she's so persistent, they can't keep her quiet, they then start out other explanations. Well, it must be his angel. This is what we do. We try to explain the very works of God. But God has the power to change the trajectory of power and authority. And we best in the church of Jesus Christ remember that. Because when we go in a few weeks to work with Jesus Loves Kalamazoo, primarily on the north side, where we see the decay and the struggle and the, the breaking down of society, which is truly in all of our homes, we wonder, can it ever change? And it can it can. Matter of fact, I'll tell you it is. Because even now we have churches joining together in this work rather than saying who's behind this, who's important, who's doing it. Oh, that's them, that's not us. We have the church of Jesus Christ in many different forms, colors, flavors, joining together, ministering in the name of Jesus Christ, pushing back at the darkness. But remember, remember when Jesus was praying that that cup would be passed from him, it was not passed from him. We still come to the difficulty that sometimes our prayers are not answered. Sometimes we pray so fervently, so earnestly, we feel that our own blood would drip out. We give it our all and we wonder if we were yet not faithful enough because the prayers were not answered. We wonder what did we miss? Our job is to pray. Our job is to pray with everything. Our job is to draw to the feet of God and pray with all that we have. But ultimately it is the glory of God. Not the glory of Peter. Not the glory of Kalamazoo. Not for the glory of the church in Kalamazoo. But for the glory of God. Peter's at the door. They come to the door. And you can imagine the explosion of excitement. You! I can't, I, what? And shh. Now was he telling them to be quiet altogether? No, no. Darkness is still out there. It's a dark time right now in the church. But let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. I was sleeping. And I got a nudge in the side. There's an angel there. And as I'm 
clear in my eyes. The chains just fell in my hands. Guard on one side and the other side, and they're not doing anything. I don't know if they were asleep or awake. It doesn't matter. He told me to put my clothes on. I did. He told me to put my cloak around me. I did. We went out the door. The other two guards, they didn't do anything. We walked around, and suddenly the next thing I know, we're at the gate of the whole system. And it just opened on its own. The message is, God did it. And Peter, even when he was standing outside, he suddenly says, now I know that God has delivered me from the hands of Herod, the hands of the power, the trajectory. God has delivered me from the hands of Herod and the expectation of the Jews. Where everybody saw it going, God has delivered them. And what does Peter say to, him, to the, those that church gathered? What does he say to us? He says, go and tell. Go and tell. Tell the brothers. Tell the other James. Tell them what happened. Our job, after we pray earnestly, is to tell what God does. Our job is to make sure his name is glorified. To lift him up. To say, you know what? We don't know what Sherry's time frame was, but we believe we got extra time. You know what? I'm sure those two women didn't expect to look girls' cookies. But they were praising God as they were. They were trusting in God. And we as a church made it our priority to pray for them, even as we all had a different trajectory in our minds. And you know what? There's a struggle here in the city of Kalamazoo. There's a lot of pain and a lot of suffering, and we wonder how we can do anything about it. God can. You know what? We're going to have a vacation Bible school, and we only have a handful of children ourselves, but we're doing it for the children that are going to come. And we wonder, are they going to come? It's up to God. And ultimately, it's for God's glory, whether they come or not. Our job is to pray and to be there. That's who we are. Now, in a moment, we're going to sing a hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Thy great Redeemer's praise. To tell. To tell the earnest prayer and the results. And you know what? We were going to sing the first five verses. But someone came to me and said, can't we sing verse 7 as well? For all of us who are struggling with back pain and, and other hip pain and knee pain, that whole idea of leaping for joy. Goodness gracious, we need to be able to think of that time we're going to leap for joy. So we're going to sing verse 7 as well, which means you're going to need your hymnal. And we're going to sing that part with gusto. A warning. The third or fourth verse, we're going to be singing more loudly ourselves. The organ will die down. But we're going to put ourselves into it. We're going to draw near to the Father. And we're going to offer our hymn up as a prayer. Let us pray together using this hymn.